All right, dealing with divorce, difficult questions and biblical answers. This is lesson number 10 in the series. It's entitled Succeeding at Remarriage. Succeeding at Remarriage. So we have to admit that this is a, uh, this particular lesson is a sensitive subject. Could be difficult for some people for a variety of reasons. Some may disagree with me on various ideas and conclusions. The very title, Succeeding at Remarriage, some people would even take exception that uh, someone would actually be teaching a class on this uh, in the church. Uh, some may have to relive personal situations that were painful because there are many people in the church who are um, in uh, second, even third marriages. Uh, there may have been some who realize that they are wrong and have to make some adjustments to their thinking you know, based on some of the things that we've studied so far. Many may simply be relieved to learn that certain things they just knew to be true in their hearts have finally been proven so with a biblical base. I've had a lot of people say to me you know, when they've um, gone through this particular course, I always knew that this is the way things ought to be, but I couldn't prove it. I, I didn't have the biblical you know, knowledge to be able to prove it. And then others may have seen weaknesses in their relationships that might take time to fix. Because when you talk about divorce, even if you're not divorced, even if you're married, this is your first marriage, talking about divorce and the causes for it and so on and so forth, uh, sometimes shines the light on existing issues and problems uh, in your marriage. So whatever the feelings, I hope that this lesson will help you uh, grow and widen your knowledge, increase your love for yourself, very important, and for those who struggle with marriage, with divorce or with remarriage, and hopefully increase your love for God and I believe this sincerely, who sees us through the trauma of divorce and even stays with us to the other, to the other side. Obviously God hates divorce uh, and I've said the reason He hates divorce is because it causes so much harm. Uh, he hates it because it's sinful, uh, but He doesn't reject uh, those who have uh, gone through that experience. So this lesson here uh, is entitled Succeeding at Remarriage and it addresses the concerns that people who are in subsequent marriages or those who are about to remarry. And so when I say subsequent marriage, I'm talking about a second marriage. Uh, you know, a, uh, whether it's through divorce or it's you were widowed or whatever it is, uh, I call it a subsequent marriage. After all, um, uh, those brethren uh, who are remarrying, they want to succeed in those marriages as well. They want to avoid divorce. Nobody <laughs> who has been through a divorce ever wants to go through another one. No one wants to go through that experience. So people who've gone through divorce and then after a certain time they, 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 they decide to remarry, they want to succeed at that marriage. They want to avoid the mistakes of the past. So this is what this uh, lesson is, uh, is all about. In my ministry I have taught at length about marriage and divorce and what I believe the Bible teaches on this subject. So just briefly to review that marriage is between a man and a woman for life. That's the Bible basic for marriage. It's the ideal. Um, I've also taught that divorce is a sin and if unrepented of will damn a person to hell just like any other sin will. I've also taught that adultery, divorce, failure at marriage can be repented of and forgiven and those guilty of it uh, who are forgiven can be renewed. You know, I go back to the story of the, uh, par uh, the prodigal son. When the father takes him back, what happens to him? Does he put him in the doghouse? Does he say, yeah, well, you messed up, you squandered your uh, inheritance, no more money for you, boy you are going to serve me as a slave and uh, you know, no more good times for you. That's not what he does. What does he do? He puts the robe on him, puts the ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. The, the idea of the sandals on the feet was that uh, slaves went barefoot. The master's son, he had, he had shoes. But to me the most significant part of that parable is the part where the father 
kills the fatted calf and has you know, a party to rejoice. The son who was lost has now been found and they're all rejoicing and enjoying themselves. And that tells me that God gives to those who have failed and come to God for uh, forgiveness. God restores them. He gives them back you know, the robe, the ring. You know, he gives them back their status, but he also gives them the right to be happy again. Just like the prodigal son had the, had the right to be at the party and to laugh and to enjoy and to, you know, to rejoice in his newfound relationship with his father. A lot of times you know, in the church I've heard people teach and you know, those who have been guilty of divorce go in for eternal punishment and it starts right here on earth. Yeah, maybe, maybe you remarry, but you better not be happy about it. <laughs> you better not enjoy it. Better feel guilty the rest of your life. This is not the Lord that we serve, brothers and sisters, not at all. So I don't believe that uh, dissolving legally contracted marriages, whether they are the second or the tenth, is the way to achieve proper repentance. Repentance, as I've mentioned before, requires an acknowledgement of the sin. What was the sin? the breaking of the covenant, the putting away of the partner without just cause. And so it requires a, a, an acknowledgement that this is what I've done. And also a change of heart concerning the things that led you to that. What led a person to do such a thing? Hardness of heart, selfishness, self-centeredness, whatever. Lust, you know, dishonesty. The repentance needs to be concerning those matters. What did you do that led you to this? This is the repentance that, that God wants. This is the repentance that will actually bring about a change in the individual. So when reconciliation is possible, I always encourage reconciliation. But when other marriages have been contracted after the divorce, I believe the best course of action is to follow Paul the Apostle's teaching in such matters. What does he say in 1 Corinthians 7, 20? He said, let each man remain in that condition in which he was called. And then he goes through it. You know, if you're married, stay married. If you're divorced, if you, you know, if you, without a wife, stay that, stay that way. Don't go back to, you know, stay the way you are. So getting remarried doesn't remove God from our lives. Some people think I have to make a choice. If, if I've divorced and I've remarried, well, it looks like I'm going to have to let go of the church. God has never given us that choice. That, that's man who does that. Marriage, by its very nature, is a call to God to help us live in the way He has designed us to live. One man and one woman. It's not natural to be alone. That's why it's so difficult to be alone if you've been widowed or divorced. It's a very difficult thing to be alone. Why? Well, because God didn't design us to live that way. He designed us to live within marriage. So for those who remarry and are trying to get it right, to these people, I give the following advice. First, realize that you are really married. Some people think that subsequent marriages are not the real thing. <laughs> you know, they're not godly marriages. I've heard people say that. Well, you may be married you know, in society, but God doesn't think you're married. Oh yeah? Where did you get that idea? Or they're not as good as the first marriage. Yeah, my first marriage, that was the good one that I screwed up. This marriage, you know, it's, like a, it's like a consolation prize. <laughs> or God is displeased with you and He won't help you. No use praying to God. You messed up the first time. You're on your own this time. No siree, Bob. You can pray for your kids. You can pray for your grandkids. You can pray for you know, climate change. <laughs> but you better not be praying for your marriage because you know, God won't answer that prayer. These thoughts are based on the idea that marriages cannot be dissolved and before God, you're always married to your first spouse as long as they are alive. 
Now I have explained to you that death dissolves a marriage in a righteous way. Romans chapter seven. And divorce dissolves a marriage in an unrighteous way. But either way the marriage is dissolved. The Bible never calls subsequent marriages adultery. Never. Never refers to them in that sense. The indissolubility of marriage, as I mentioned before, is a Roman Catholic idea begun at the Council of Trent in 1545. The idea was only God can marry you and only God can unmarry you. Now the goal here was to give to the church authority in marital affairs. That was the underlying goal. Making the church, the Catholic church in this case, making the church, putting the church in control of marriage. The Bible, of course, we know, it is the thing that has the last word on marriage. Not clergymen, not churches. In the Catholic church, it was ultimately the pope who could give you an annulment of your marriage. The clergy had the power to dissolve your marriage. And you had, if you were a poor person, you had to have like lots of good reasons. You know, your partner was called away to war the second day of your marriage and is missing in action for seven years. You know, can I finally get an annulment so that I may remarry and continue on with my, you know, this, this, was, this is how it worked. If you were rich, if you were a nobleman, if you were in the top tier society, then you could buy your way out. But the whole idea was to put the church, to put men in charge of who could marry and who could not marry. I mean, if you control what a person eats and you control marriage, you pretty much control that person. And this idea, this indissolubility of marriage, somehow this idea crept into you know, the restoration movement thinking. Uh, it's been pinpointed somewhere at the end of the uh, uh, 19th century. People started writing about this in our brotherhood and there was a faction that began to push this idea, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't so. We need to understand that God will help us with our marriage if we ask Him. And society, and that includes our family, must respect what God respects and honors. Jesus tells us to forgive 70 times seven, right? Surely God can forgive one failed marriage and help a person get it right if they're willing the next time around. When you're legally married, you are bound by man and God to be faithful to your partner, to do your best to succeed in remaining married until death do you part, because you are really married to this and only this one person, whether that's a first marriage or a second marriage. So that first one is equal to that second one. Why? If it's contracted legally, and especially if it's done so in faith. Because what are we actually trying to do when we remarry? We're trying to get right what we failed at. Has God ever been against an individual who is trying to do his will and asked him for help to do so? Number two, understand that your marriage is perfect through the cross of Christ. If you were a non-Christian and divorced and then remarried, you would be legally married to the second person, but your soul would be charged with the sin of adultery because of your divorce. You know, when a person divorces without cause, the sin that they commit is called adultery. Okay? So even if you legally divorce and remarry 10 times, each time the sin of adultery would be charged to your soul. At death, the world would bury a much married person. 
but the world would hold nothing against you because everything you did was done legally. If you were married and divorced 10 times legally, no one could charge you with a crime or a misdemeanor because you did everything according to the law. But God would condemn you to hell because you could be guilty of adultery. Not because you remarried, because you <laughs> divorced without cause 10 times. Now the person who becomes a Christian, even though he may be or she may be divorced and remarried, is forgiven for his adultery and thus made perfect in God's eyes. That's the good news, folks. Why do you think people are happy to hear the good news? <laughs> the bad stuff I did that I can't fix, Jesus has fixed for me on the cross. That's good news, <laughs> great news. Where's the gospel? Okay, where, where is the good news of the gospel? If someone who comes to Christ uh, is told, oh, oh you, can't be you, you can't be baptized. Oh, no, no. You, you've been married 25 years, your second marriage 25 years, you have children and grandchildren, oh, too bad, so sad. You have to break that up and go back to the original white work. You remember, we've talked about this. Now. Where's the good news there? <laughs> the Christian, who divorces and repents is also forgiven for his sin of adultery. Now many people find this hard to accept because God's grace doesn't make a distinction about which sins to forgive or not. People are ready to forgive somebody if they robbed a bank and paid their debt to society. Oh, oh let's go further. They robbed the bank and pistol whipped the woman teller all right, and they go to jail for 15 years for that. Paid their debt to society. We're ready to, that, that man is ready to, you know, he may be all tatted up and gangbanger and whatever. We're ready to forgive him, a brother. But the woman who's had a divorce, you know, she had a divorce and she's been remarried. Yeah, we're, no, you can't come in. You, your sin can't be forgiven. It doesn't make any sense. Now the repentance requires a change of heart, not a change of attitude, excuse me, a change of heart and a change of attitude, but what makes the person perfect in God's sight is not how he or she is able to fix any former marriages. It's not how well that person may succeed in a subsequent marriage. Of course, repentance requires that they try their best. Perfection, brothers and sisters, is a free gift given to a person who believes in Jesus and expresses that belief in repentance and baptism and then continues in faithful living. That's how we're made perfect before God. So, th so that our lies, our failures, our adulteries, our, you know, all of our bad stuff is paid for by the cross of Jesus Christ. Regardless of your marital status, God makes you perfect through the cross of Christ, not through your relative success in marital relationships. Boy, if, people, if the only way people could get to heaven is through successful marriage, <laughs> we'd be having a problem. Number three. Follow the Bible's advice for remarried. What? There's advice in the Bible for remarried people? Of course, there isn't a chapter in the Bible addressing, addressed to people who are remarried. Wouldn't it be nice? Then we could be sure that God loves us and includes us in His family. But there is a lot of advice for people who have failed. And isn't that what divorce and remarriage is all about? It's about failure, trying again. Weak and sinful people who have failed at a complex and demanding relationship and who are trying again to get it right. Why is it that we are so gracious to those who have failed at telling the truth or failed at believing in Jesus or failed at not killing other people, but we lack so much compassion for those who have failed at marriage? 
It's not a greater sin than something else. God is kind and patient towards all those who fail and are willing with His help to do better, to try again. So to these He provides help and advice in His work. So basic advice for those who fail from the Bible, forget the past. Forget the past. You know, Peter says, or Philippians, uh, Paul says, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. The past is where the failure is, where the pain is. I tell people, let it go, let it go. If a person is forgiven by God, they can forgive themselves and turn away from the past. Now if God hasn't forgiven you, well then you, you have no right to forgive yourself. But if God has forgiven you, then you can forgive yourself, it's okay. Dwelling on what happened, what might have been done differently, why it all happened, will not change the past, it will only keep the past alive in the present. And that goes for the guilty party as well as the innocent party, for both. Trying to fix the past by punishing ourselves, by punishing our ex-partner, bargaining with God, only manages to delay the healing. Some people don't want to heal because constant pain is their way of trying to atone for their past failure in marriage. I repeat that. I repeat that. Some people do not want to heal because constant pain is their way of trying to atone for the past failure in marriage. If I continue to beat myself up over that failure, well then maybe somehow I'll be okay. If they heal, they have nothing to offer their conscience or God and they're afraid of punishment. At least I can offer my pain up to God for having messed up. God doesn't want your pain. Satan wants your pain. He wants you to beat yourself up every single day. Remember I told you it's a, it's a game of attrition with him. He's going to lose. He's already lost. So it's just about taking everything away from you each and every day. If you, if you have a chance of 10 seconds of happiness in one day, he's going to try to spoil that for you. Because if he can't you know, tempt you to do something to, to sell your soul, he's going to spoil whatever good you've got. So Paul here is speaking of his former life and the terrible failure uh, in it. Now he had been forgiven and the way that he forgave himself is that he refused to dwell on the failure that he had been absolved of and he concentrated on the future that God had freely offered him. Remember I told you, you don't see Paul going back trying to kind of pay the, pay the bail to get people he had thrown in jail out of jail. He didn't go on an apology tour knocking on doors. Remember me? You know, I came in the middle of the night, dragged your husband out, <laughs> threw him in jail, beat you. Remember that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that. Is there something I can do? Maybe a little, a few dollars. You know, you don't see him do that. What does he do? He said, look, uh, that happened. That was terrible. Uh, I could have lost my soul over that. But guess what? God's forgiven me. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to honor his forgiveness and I'm going to you know, pay attention to the future. I'm going to make the best of what he's given me. Forgetting the past is not only healthy, but it's the ongoing way that we express our faith to God. Forgetting the past says, I believe that you have forgiven me and I focus on you, Lord, and not my failure. Whatever that failure is. Secondly, learn from the past. You know, forget the past. If you want to do something with it, learn. The past is there, the failure, whether it's our fault or somebody else's fault or a mixture of both, the past is there, it's history. There are many reminders of it. The key is not to whine about the past or dwell and mourn over it, but to use it by learning from it to help ourselves today. Repentance is a change of heart. 
The past helps us understand where we uh, were and what we need to do in order to repent. In the past, I used to be a, a flirt. I used to kind of you know, flirt all the time and, you know, and, and that flirting got me into trouble and then, uh, and then eventually led me to uh, cheat on my wife, which led to divorce, which led to pain and suffering and the breakup of our family. And I've come to God to ask Him to forgive me for breaking the marriage, for all of that stuff that I did. And now time goes by and I'm, I'm remarried. Well, you know what? One of the things I'm not doing anymore yeah, I'm not flirting anymore. I'm not drawing attention to myself anymore. I'm not saying little things to try to set up a little intimacy with other women or men or whatever, you know, which way it goes. I'm not going to do that anymore. That's repentance. And if I see a sign that perhaps I'm, I'm getting just a little too close to somebody or somebody's getting a little too close for me, I'm going to tell my wife and say, hey, you know, Susie at the office, you know, I kind of think she's cute and she's paying a whole lot of attention to me. Why don't you come to the, to the office party and let's uh, make sure that everybody knows that we're together. You're my wife, I'm your husband, there's no fooling around. You know, that's real time repentance. That's what God wants. Not for us to hide up in a cave somewhere and you know, whip ourselves. The past usually shows us that our failure was due to the fact that we did things our way. Repentance means that in the future we're going to do it God's way. Many second marriages fail because the people, guilty or innocent, enter into them with the same attitude that they had in the first marriage. Many fail because many issues remain unresolved and we end up beating up our second spouses for the things that our original spouse did. That's the flip side of it. I talked about the guilty person, the innocent person, quote, innocent person, you know, that lady whose husband you know, dumped her, the flirt guy, you know, she gets remarried. What does she do? Boy, she looks at his phone and she's checking his stuff and she's going to see who emailed him and she's calling the office 10 times a day and if a woman answers the phone at the office, who is that? My advice to divorced people is to get counseling so that you can learn from the past who you are, why it failed, before entering into a serious relationship. Getting married again doesn't solve problems from the first marriage. They need to be solved before getting married again because subsequent marriages, they bring a whole new set of problems. If you've learned something from the past, you'll be better equipped to deal with uh, you know, remarriage and issues in the future. So forget the past, learn from the past, let your changed life be a witness for Christ. Paul the Apostle often began his sermons with the story of his own conversion, how a person who despised Christians grew to love the church so much that he was ready to die for it. Now there's a testimony for you. If you base your marriage on biblical principles, if you live your life as a faithful and fruitful Christian, if people see that it's possible to take a failed life and a failed marriage and through Jesus Christ build a new life and a new and wonderful marriage, guess who is glorified? You know, God is glorified. You know, Jesus said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Right? Matthew 5, 16. A loving relationship, a Christian home, these are good works even if they are produced by a subsequent marriage. They will honor God and they will provide a witness for the power of Christ in your life. So Jesus came to save, to build, to encourage, to equip, not to judge, not to punish, not to criticize. So if you failed at marriage for whatever reason, regardless of the times, I tell people, ask Jesus to forgive you. And then forget those past mistakes. I know you can't forget them, but forget in the sense, don't allow the past mistakes 
to define who you are now. I'm a different person. I was a different person back there. There are things I didn't know. There were, there were mistakes that I made. There were influences on me that I didn't know how to handle. But now, now I know, now I've learned, now I've changed. I'm not that person anymore. Do not judge me by that. Because God does not judge me by that. The moment He forgives me, the cross of Jesus covers all of that. That's dead and gone. And if it's, listen, if it's dead and gone to God, then it's got to be dead and gone to you too. And then let the Lord teach you how to succeed. <laughs> we have this idea that God is there ready to punish us for any mistake or any failure in marriage. We don't realize God wants us to succeed at marriage. He designed us for marriage. He equipped us within marriage to experience the highest level of joy and pleasure and assurance possible for a human being. Why would He want us to fail at that? Why would He deny us the opportunity to try again to get that right? And then offer your new success to Him as a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. You know, God is interested in renewal and rebirth and regeneration. And this is true in marriage as well as every other area in our, in our lives. But it is true especially in marriage because it's the thing that everybody in the world sees. They don't see you know, your secret thoughts and all that business, but everybody kind of sees your marriage. What a way to honor God, to succeed at your present marriage, if it's your first, or to succeed at your subsequent marriage. As long as God gets the honor, that, that's, that's what's important. Okay, so obviously that's not all there is to say about people who attempt or are in a second or subsequent marriages, but it's a beginning anyways. Remember that God is for you. God wants you to succeed. Don't, don't ever forget that. Okay. So we're going to stop here and continue on in our series uh, next time we meet. Thank you very much for your attention.